Thank you, Dr. Bantinelli. We know that a male model for healthcare discovery and delivery has led to significant health inequalities for women. We also know that the health of women is a key component to the health of families and communities because women truly make the majority of healthcare decisions. Northwell believes that a focus on the health of all women we serve as we become a national leader in this space is a critical component of our focus on health equity. We believe that everyone deserves a fair and just opportunity to stay as healthy as possible, and that requires a thoughtful and deliberate approach to improving the health of women. I am truly honored to be joined today with two visionary leaders in this field. Dr. Janine Clayton, the Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health and Associate Director for Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health, and Nancy Brown, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Heart Association. Under Nancy's leadership since 2008, the AHA has become truly a global leader on cardiovascular and brain health, as well as a driving force on equitable health care for all. Dr. Clayton, could you please tell us a little bit more about your role, how you came to focus on women's health, and what's your priorities at the NIH presently? Great to be here, Dr. Rosen. At the Office of Research on Women's Health at NIH, we work on advancing the issue of women's health and how sex and gender play a role in health and disease across all 27 institutes and centers at NIH. So the, whether that's the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute or the National Institute on Mental Health, we take a head-to-toe approach to the health of women. We also look at this from a policy perspective. We ensure that women are included in NIH-supported clinical research around the world, wherever that research is being conducted. And we also led the advancement of the sex as a biological variable policy, which requires investigators for animal and human studies to consider sex as a biological variable in their research designs, analyses, and reporting. And the third piece of our job is to make sure that women in biomedical careers reach their full potential, and that is all women. So those are the ways that we work across those 27 institutes and centers in order to support research relative to, to the health of women. And our ultimate goal is what we call advancing rigorous research for the health of women. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Thank you. That's fabulous. Um, we uh, are excited to have you here and appreciate the work and the prioritization of this important mission. N Nancy, why not tell us a little bit about the American Heart Association's commitment to disparities in women's cardiovascular health over well over a decade, a decade and a half, as well as some newer initiatives focused more globally on the health of women and health equity? Well, thank you, Dr. Rosen. It's just an honor to be here with you today. And of course, with Dr. Clayton, such an amazing leader in uh, research for women. I'm really proud of the work the American Heart Association has focused on related to women and cardiovascular disease. And just to level set the information base, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women it claims the lives of more women than all forms of cancer combined. And in fact, every year, cardiovascular diseases kill one woman, one woman about every 80 seconds. And so this is an aggressive disease that really requires an equally aggressive response. And that's why at the American Heart Association, we've taken a multi-pronged approach to address the issue of women in cardiovascular disease. Of course, everything we do at the AHA starts with science, and we are a large funder of science, second only to the National Institutes of Health in terms of funding research for cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease in women. We've funded about $4.8 billion in research in the last five decades or so. And that research has really helped us understand uh, and increase the knowledge base about heart disease and stroke, including in women. And it also helps us create our policy positions and helps us with the guidelines that we write for women and cardiovascular disease. Uh, we know, uh, as an example, that only 38% of clinical trial participants are women. And so every day we are working uh, to change that number and to help women enroll in clinical trials. And of course, we do much of this work under the banner of our signature women's health initiative, Go Red for Women, which has been increasing women's heart health awareness and serving as a catalyst for change since 2004 here in the U.S. and around the world. 
The last thing I'll say, Stacey, is that I know we all are aware that COVID-19 has heightened the urgent call to action given the long-term effects of the virus on survivors' hearts, brains, and vascular systems, including in women, especially those in underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. So, 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 Dr. Clayton, Nancy brought up um, challenges historically in research, whether it was related to sex as a biologic variable, and if you could um, expand a little bit on that, as well as other historic issues about a male model of health, women not being included. I, I've been practicing cardiology for, you know, over 30 years, and it's still perceived as a male's illness, a man's disease, despite everything Nancy told us about the data. Data. Tell us a little bit more about the history of research and how we got here. All right, absolutely. So as we started out, women were not routinely included in clinical research, and those findings from those clinical studies were applied to both men and women. Now we know that's a problem, and back in the day, we really didn't realize how different men and women were, and we didn't understand that there was a problem in terms of the rigor of such an approach. So today, women represent over half of the participants of NIH-supported clinical research, broadly in aggregate. Uh, unfortunately, this male model was also carried forward in our basic science or our laboratory research, our preclinical research, and that's so important to inform our clinical studies. And so male animals, male cells were uh, considered standard. And so we know that one size fits all unisex research doesn't address the health needs of women and men. In fact, it's less rigorous by definition because it has is biased from the outset. So now that we know that every single cell in your body has a sex, it's either XX or XY, we know that, that that's important to consider in the preclinical space as we translate into the clinical space. So you mentioned, Dr. Rosen, when we don't have enough women in clinical studies, that means the study findings. We may not understand whether a treatment works as well in men and women, whether the side effects of our treatment are different in men and women, whether the dosage that we're of the drug or the intervention is appropriate for men and women. And so we're missing out. In fact, we are creating more knowledge gaps and we know less about female biology and the health of women because of our historic over-reliance on male animal models and men in clinical trials. So we need to make a change. And uh, we've got knowledge gaps, but we have exciting ways to fill those gaps as we, as we move forward. Wonderful. So, so even though, if I may, even though sex and gender, the terms are often used interchangeably, they're not. Can you help clarify the difference between, and, and, and how, does, how, how does your institute focus on gender issues as well as sex? Great question. So sex is a biological variable. It's determined by sex chromosomes, XX or XY, typically matches reproductive organs and genitalia. So when we talk about sex, it's about biology. When we talk about gender, gender is a multidimensional social construct. It talks about behaviors, dynamics, expectations, uh, the clothes we choose to wear, the fact that in Western countries, caregiving is predominantly delivered by women is a gendered behavior. And that also affects health. Clearly, caregiving responsibilities can affect the health of the caregiver. So sex and gender are related to each other, and they both influence health and disease. And so even though we're the Office of Research on Women's Health, we work to integrate both sex and gender considerations across the life course into everything that we do, and especially with our collaborations with our institute and center partners. Perfect, thank you. So, so, so Nancy, the AHA has focused recently a tremendous amount and something that's I found inspiring on social determinants of health. We know that historically your ability to stay healthy as an individual is only to a small extent related to what goes on a traditional healthcare um, place, a, a hospital, a, an emergency department, and what goes on outside. This is particularly impactful for women, again, to uh, not just sex as a difference, but to the issues related to women's gendered role in society. Can we talk a little bit about the expanded um, um, mission of the American Heart Association focusing outside of what many might have considered traditional scientific endeavors? 
Absolutely, I, I would be delighted to do that. And before I answer that, I'd love to just um, add on one additional component to Dr. Clayton's comments on uh, women and the study of women. One of the things we need to do is we all become aware of the differences of, uh, of women and how they are or aren't represented in trials. And of course, I'm, I must say that in cardiovascular disease, there are unique complicators like pregnancy and menopause that over our life span put us at greater risk for developing cardiovascular diseases, including Minoka, um, which is a heart attack without blocked arteries, which often goes undiagnosed or untreated by doctors. And so we, at the AHA, we identify problems and work with partners, but we try to always bring solutions to the table. And this is why we created Research Goes Red, which is a collaboration between the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women um, program and Verily's Project Baseline, where we're making participation in studies and trials easier, simple, and more democratized. And so we have strong engagement where we're able to talk to women um, in things like surveys and focus groups, as well as in funded studies. And so I think as we identify these problems, it's always good to talk about how we're, we're working to address them. And, and Dr. Rosen, on your comment about the social determinants of health, you're absolutely right. You know, when we think about the factors that impact a person's health and well being overall, we often think about the clinical setting where a person comes to receive their care. But of course, people aren't living their life in a clinical setting. They're living in communities with their families. Um, and we have uh, recognized in the past 10 to 15 years or so that issues like um, do people have safe places to get physical activity? Do they have access to food at all? And is that food healthful? You know, what about employment? What about income security? What about caregiving that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Clayton? These social determinants of health uh, have a tremendous impact on a person's risk um, and a person's chance of developing cardiovascular disease in their lifetime. You know, some really important facts to understand that cardiovascular disease um, affects one in two black women compared to one in three white women. Um, and Hispanic women are more prone to developing heart disease a decade earlier than non-Hispanic white women. And so, you know, peeling back the onion of why this is happening, we must include the social determinants of health, the items that I mentioned, food, housing, access to physical activity, income equality, access to high quality, affordable health care. All of these are issues that have to be addressed. And we also have to look at the impact of structural racism to poor health and premature death. Um, at the AHA, we publish a lot of scientific documents and scientific statements. We recently um, declared structural racism a cause of poor health and premature death from heart disease and stroke in a presidential advisory we released last year in November. And as a follow-on to that, the AHA has committed more than $230 million between now and 2020 to identify and remove barriers uh, to structural racism and to address these causes of poor health. Thank you. I think all of this work is inspiring and it's expanded um, the opportunities to define what the health of women means to each of us. Um, we, we all know that maternal mortality and maternal poor outcomes is a classic example of things that are unique to women, things that um, structural racism, um, other social determinants of health have brought this to be almost a crisis level here in the United States. I would ask each of you to comment in your sphere where the priorities are. Dr. Clayton, would you like to go first? Absolutely. So maternal morbidity and mortality, we're calling it a collision of crises, Dr. Rosen. And so I think your words were aptly put. Uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, the rates of maternal mortality were rising and they are higher than all of our peer countries and they're highest for African-American and uh, American Indian Alaska Native women. And they have been for some time. So we're focusing there on addressing cardiovascular disease, mental health, infection and immunity, as well as individual consequences of experiences of discrimination and structural racism in an effort called IMPROVE. 
And that is an effort that I'm pleased to co-chair with my other leaders at NIH to try to bring new research into this space. And we are also thinking about maternal morbidity and mortality with a life course perspective. So we need to understand how to have women be healthier going into their pregnancy, because we know rates of obesity have increased, rates of hypertension have increased. And so we have a life course perspective looking at the health of women before they become pregnant. We're working on uh, strategies to help assess and risk when women are at risk for premature birth or higher risk outcomes. So we're doing that through small business innovation awards, as well as our research awards. And then we're looking at postpartum health as well, up to the full year postpartum. We know, for example, that postpartum cardiomyopathy is an important cause of late maternal morbidity and mortality, especially for African-American women. So with an NHLBI, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, we're focusing on postpartum cardiomyopathy. And then even beyond that pregnancy, which can be in uh, pre-pregnancy for a subsequent pregnancy, we're looking at the health of women in the reproductive age in total. A head-to-toe approach, mental health, cardiovascular health, um, pulmonary health, uh, neuro, neuro, neurological systems and health across the board. And so we have programs that are focused on understudied, underreported, and underrepresented populations of women or U3 populations. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of the ways we're addressing this across the board. Wonderful, thank you. Nancy, I'm ecstatic to see the new folk, well, the new expanded focus on maternal health from the AHA. Could you tell us a little more? Well, absolutely, and, and Dr. Rosen, you have been an inspiration to us in creating this focus, so I want to thank you um, for inspiring all of us at the AHA to really deepen our focus on equity gaps, uh, especially as it relates to maternal health. I'll mention that in addition to all of the wonderful information Dr. Clayton just provided, that we've recently issued a policy statement on maternal health called Saving Mom's Lives. It's a policy roadmap to better health before during and after pregnancy. And it really identifies all along the way things that we can be doing um, to help create environments to allow women to have the best chance possible at having a healthy pregnancy and, and to raise uh, healthy children uh, after pregnancy and to become healthy themselves. The sad reality is that pregnancy-related deaths are rising at an alarming rate, posting an increase of 140% over the last three decades in the U.S., and cardiovascular disease is a leading cause. So, of course, at the HA, we have made this a major priority. Um, as Dr. Uh, Clayton noted, this um, speaks also to mental health and well-being, as well as risk factors of women um, who, uh, before they become pregnant, and helping women get in the best possible um, physical and mental shape before pregnancy. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is we also are aware that um, some women who have pre-existing cardiovascular conditions are also at higher risk, and we really um, encourage and support women in their partnership with their healthcare provider to make sure that they can have the safest pregnancy as possible. Uh, we need to raise awareness of women, though, I would say. You know, all of this great work that we're doing, the, the women who are contemplating, you know, uh, pregnancy really need to understand how factors like obesity, elevation, blood pressure and other risk factors affect their chance of having a healthful baby. And so there is a need for physician uh, and healthcare provider awareness. There is a need for awareness among uh, women of childbearing age. And I think we all can work together to really continue to increase the focus in this area. Thank you both. I, I, of course, could continue this conversation all day, but I can't. So what I'd like each of you to finish up with is, um, what does the world of women's health look like in the future for the next generation of advocates, clinicians, scientists, volunteers, and, and what bold, transformative ideas do we need to get there? Um, Dr. Clayton, if you would. So absolutely, the world of the future and a magic wand. Uh, I would say the world of the future has sex and gender considered from the outset, not as an afterthought. And so that means the health of women, the health of men, the health of individuals of older ages is part of how we do medicine, right? And so I like to say sex and gender specific research and care is square one. 
starting out from the beginning. And it's embedded in our way of thinking about research, clinical care, and even reimbursement is better, is, is improved, is more efficient with this mindset. So from a scientific perspective, it creates more rigorous and reproducible research. From a personalized care perspective, it creates more individualized care for each and every patient. And from a healthcare system perspective, it's more efficient and it provides better value. So a missed heart attack, for example, is expensive and underdiagnosed depression is also expensive in addition to the impact on that individual. So studying sex and gender in the future is gonna be deliver better care, earlier detection, shorter hospitalizations, fewer adverse event drug reactions and lead to a more sustainable healthcare system. Wonderful, thank you. And Nancy, if you had a magic wand at the Heart Association, what, what would the future look like and how would we get there? Well, I'd start with everything Dr. Clayton said because I agree with all of her points. You know, I think we know and understand that equal access to high quality, affordable healthcare for every person in this country, including women, needs to be a priority because without that, it's very difficult for the healthcare system to help women um, achieve ideal health throughout their, life, throughout their lifespan. I might take this in a different direction. My magic wand would help women understand the importance of putting themselves in the driver's seat of their own health and well-being. You know, we want all all women to make themselves a priority. Uh, I always like to quote our uh, dear friend, Susan Lucci, who's an American Heart Association advocate um, as a heart disease survivor. And she always says, women need to put themselves at the top of their to-do list. You know, we know that heart disease is preventable. We need women to know their numbers, their blood pressure, cholesterol, body weight, and blood sugar. We need them not to smoke. And also, you know, encouraging women to participate in research, including in Research Goes Red, as I uh, referenced earlier. And the last thing I would do with my magic wand is I would remove all of these inequities that are the true drivers of disparity in this country. And I think we have so much work to do. It will take all of us working together to achieve this wonderful vision for women and for all people in this country. Thank you. Well, uh, as we finish up, I cannot thank you enough both for joining me today for this conversation, but also for the groundbreaking work you've done over decades and what I know you and your organizations will continue to do to improve the health of women. So thank you both, Dr. Janine Clayton, Nancy Brown. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. My pleasure.